Welcome to the Ringer NFL show. Sheil Kapadia here with Deontay Lee and Steven Ruiz. If you're listening or watching on FanDuel TV, welcome. If you're listening on Spotify, welcome. Week four in the books. Not quite a quarter of the season. We can't say that yet, but uh, some narratives took shape, I feel like, this weekend, Deontay. You know, some some stuff. Now you're saying I got four games worth to look at. I can start saying what I want to say about the way this season's going to go. 100%. And this for me was probably like my biggest sicko, you know, type of viewing experience. I was saying before we jumped on, had my personal laptop, work laptop up. They had different games on, had the full multi-view up on the main TV. So my ADHD was 100% satisfied through the day. At one point uh, during the the second half of the first window of games, I had all all, all eight games up on wow. two different screens. I, I was quad boxing on two different screens. I had all eight games up. It was it was very, it was a sicko moment for me too. That's a young man's game. I, I don't even go down those streets anymore. You know, some things you don't even try at my age and that would be one of them. But I was tuned in to the Sunday night game. We thought we got to get a classic. The Bills don't get blown out. The Ravens have their, kind of have their backs against the wall. But what happens? The Ravens come out and they crush the Buffalo Bills. We're going to start with our big takeaways. And my big takeaway is that that's the Ravens team we expected to see. I don't think many teams in the NFL have that type of performance in their back where they can come out against a Bills team who had not lost a regular season game by more than six points in the last three seasons. And they come out... And they just, everything's working. Derrick Henry runs for 199 yards. Lamar Jackson's doing what he needs to do. But I would say most impressive was that, and what I learned the most was about that Ravens defense. When you hold Josh Allen and that Bills offense to one touchdown, to 10 points, to 12 first downs, their fewest first downs in a game in the last five years, that really caught my attention. So Ravens have had kind of an unsettled start to their season, Ruiz. But now after week four, it's like, no, no, this is kind of the team we were expecting to see, and they're going to be in the mix the rest of the way. I'm fully convinced that that Raiders game was fake. It didn't happen. Some it was a deep fake. It did. Someone edited it. It was photoshopped. I don't care. I didn't watch any of it, and I refuse to believe that it happened. This was what it was supposed to look like coming into the off season, especially with Derrick Henry. Like I don't know if it was supposed to look like 199 yards yeah. and 270 total rushing yards for the team, but the idea was to bring in Derrick Henry and take some of that playmaking burden and some of that attention off of Lamar Jackson, who had been the main source of explosive plays both in the run game and the pass game coming into this year. Not anymore. Not anymore. Derrick Henry is leading the NFL in rushing by about 35 yards, and Lamar Jackson is ninth in rushing. These two are on pace to combine for 3,306 yards this season. Wow. They've combined for 700 yards over the first four weeks. It's uh, (laughs) insane. And like you said, we finally saw the version of the defense that we saw all throughout last season. It wasn't just that Josh Allen struggled. It was how he struggled. Like he had to hold on to the ball for a long time, which makes you believe like, of course, we have to watch the film to know what was happening downfield. But it makes you believe that receivers weren't getting open. And that had been the problem with the Ravens defense. The run defense had been good. The pass coverage, especially when in man coverage, wasn't sticking tight to to routes. But if you watched the film, you were like, all right, it's it's just a matter of time. They're going to clear this up. And we saw it tonight. And this looked like the best football team in the NFL right now. It was definitely the most impressive performance of the season so far. Yeah, I think I agree with that, Deontay. And and when you you look at what they did defensively, you know, early on, they're giving up some explosive plays. But to to Ruiz's point, that really stuck out to me because so much of the conversation about these two quarterbacks, when we talk about them on, on this show, I feel like our conversations are, did he have to be Superman tonight? Or did he not have to be Superman tonight? We know they can be. They can put the cape on, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, how did they win that game? Because the quarterback was incredible. Previously, the first three weeks of the season, we were talking about, hey, Josh Allen, he hasn't had to just put the whole team on his back. Stuff is within structure. He looks comfortable. It's efficient. In this game, though, he was holding the football, eight quarterback hits by the Baltimore Ravens. Even the one touchdown they scored, he's falling out of bounds and chucks one 50 yards, which we enjoy watching, but that's not how you want to live. So uh, what did you think, Deontay? More tells us more about the Bills offense or the Ravens defense, that type of game. 
I say the Ravens defense, and it's funny because early in the game, I was kind of concerned, right? Like I felt like, you know, you could tell that Baltimore was playing pretty soft in coverage, trying to just play like give takeaway explosives, make him play more underneath. And what we had seen from Josh Allen over the last couple of weeks had led me to believe that he can beat a defense just as well being forced to play that game as being able to play bombs away. Um, but I think you saw as the game went on and the more that Buffalo was trying to pry that defense open to find explosives, especially once the game script got away from them and took away the opportunities to run the ball and really play dink and dunk offense. That's really where I thought you saw Baltimore be at its best defensively because it was playing so well on the back end, not allowing them to just push the ball down the field. And I think that that speaks to what this secondary is like and why we have spent so much time talking about, even with the loss of Mike McDonald, why they could be pretty stable on a week by week basis. When you think about the guys that they can move around, whether it's Marlon Humphrey inside and outside, you see Kyle Hamilton in the slot at times, deep and others. Marcus Williams looks healthy and good, you know, when he's on the field. Um, Nate Wiggins, a rookie, has been a really good contributor for them early in the season. They have so many pieces that they can use in coverage, and I think that that's kind of allowed their pass rush to develop slowly, and we got to see that in the second half. Odafe Owe was starting to make a much bigger impact. You saw Namdi Matabike really pushing the pocket and making him uncomfortable when he did have to hold the ball. So I just think that to, to Steven's point, this is a team that we thought we were going to see. And I think if you take the fourth quarter, or really from like the halfway point in the third quarter through the end of the game against the Raiders out of the picture, I would say that they've been the best team, the one of the best teams in the league from wire to wire in the NFL, they've just caught some bad breaks with penalties and turnover luck. I think for the first time, we got to see them not have boneheaded penalties, really derail drives, and them not have silly turnovers outside of Lamar's fumble on that scramble. And when you get those things and you have the run game and you're not making mistakes, you get to see what this team is supposed to be. And that's a team that can really kind of change gears on you, pound you on offense, and be able to take away explosive plays defensively. I, I thought we agreed the Raiders game didn't happen. We don't have to exclude the third and fourth quarter. It didn't happen. Okay. Let's just agree. Never the, NFL the, rest of the, game yeah. the rest of the year. But I, I know we're going to spend this time lavishing praise on the Ravens, which we should do. I just want to talk about that that Josh Allen throw when he was on the sideline to Shakir. Oh, my gosh. I, I, just ridiculous. How? He's a ridiculous player. I don't care if they lost this game. This game has done nothing to derail my take that he's been the best quarterback in the NFL so far this season. He was just, he just ran into a great defense and a great defensive performance in a game script, like Deontay said, that really works against you as a quarterback and works in the favor of a defense like Baltimore. Yeah, I don't have big concerns about the Buffalo Bills after this game. I think the Ravens played pretty much except for like Deontay mentioned that Lamar Jackson fumble they played near their like a plus game you ran into him uh on that night and we'll say if it's two or three weeks and we're saying hey he's holding the ball and wait he's going back to having to be Superman and maybe the supporting cast isn't as good then I'll have that conversation I'm not going to have it after one game I mean their longest run tonight was eight yards they've been running the football really well some things didn't go their way and you know Derrick Henry, not fun. 24 times Derrick Henry. But, and it wasn't just Derrick Henry. I mean, they were blocking their butts off. We've talked about their offensive line before, and they were just uh, Patrick Ricard, Mark Andrews even on that first long run. They they were taking guys out on the bill. So I think these are going to be two teams that are there towards the end of the season. That, that Bill's defense was making a lot of business decisions with number 22 running in the open field. And I, I can't blame it's them. It's a long he, season, yeah. You know? he's, yeah. He's kind of been like a bully for this Buffalo team throughout his career over the last couple yeah. of years he's had a big like I, re I remember that that stiff arm I think on Josh Norman where he basically bounced him off the ground like a basketball yeah. and I think the Ravens might have seen those performance and that might have inspired them to bring him in because they've had issues as we cover on the Friday show they've had issues against this defense and running the football against this defense it did not look like it on Sunday night yeah, Derrick Henry's had so many moments for someone who hasn't like been in the Super Bowl. He's had a lot of moments against these top tier AFC teams over the years. I mean, he went to Baltimore and threw a jump pass and upset uh, maybe the best version we've seen of that Ravens team. All right, we'll take a break. We come back, get to some other big takeaways from week four. on the ringer nfl show ruiz sam darnold and the vikings go to green bay 
Jordan Love plays and the Vikings just jump all over them and win that game 31-29. What did you see? What a strange game. Like this score is both misleading and not misleading. Like the pa- the, the Vikings blew this game out and it wasn't super competitive. I know the Packers like stormed back and almost got back into it, but it never felt like the Vikings were going to lose this game. But if you go back to the first quarter, this game really swung on two dropped passes. There was a drop on third down. It was kind of a bad throw by Jordan Levin. There was a drop of a Sam Darn pick that preceded the opening drive touchdown. If you reverse the results of those plays, I don't know. Maybe it goes in, in Green Bay's favor. Maybe the, they're the team that get out ahead 28 to nothing and, and the Vikings have to come back. But I think my main takeaway is that out of all of the, the people involved in the Vikings this year that could be – picked as their MVP, whether it's a coach or a player. It could be Kevin O'Connell. It could be Brian Flores. It could be Sam Darnold. Justin Jefferson's still the heart and soul of this team. He's still the best player on the team. He's still what this offense is built out of. And we saw how the gravity affected Green Bay's defense early on, where they were throwing a bunch of double teams on obvious passing situations. And that was opening things up for Addison elsewhere on the field. And that's how the Vikings scored their first two points, or first two touchdowns. They had huge plays where Jefferson's getting doubled or getting extra attention, and another receiver makes a play. And then you saw the Packers adjust in the second half, and they started taking away those extra bodies. And that's when Jefferson came up with, Two remarkable catches. His, his touchdown catch is one of the greatest displays of concentration I've ever seen. Like the ball ricochets off his shoulder pad, off the Packers shoulder pad, the, <laughs> the Packers defender shoulder pad. And then he catches it with his right hand, with one hand, he pins it against his chest. And this all happens in maybe 0.5 seconds. These these four ricochets, like a double doink off of uh, the, the pads of the players, and it, it's an amazing catch. And then he seals the game with the catch, I think it was on third and 11, where I don't know how he got those two feet down, but you saw both ends of his skill set. Like you saw the physical contested catch, and then you saw the acrobatic sprawling catch. And then throughout the game, you just see him, you know, doing everything else he does well. He's a great route runner. He can he can make those 50-50 catches. He can make those acrobatic catches. He could beat double teams. He could beat single teams. He's good against man. He's good against zone. He's like the ultimate weapon and the ultimate receiver. And I think if you take him off this team, the story totally changes with this offense. And as we've talked about before, you never want the coach or the offensive coordinator where it's like, why isn't a player like that getting the ball? You know, and you never really have to worry about that with the Vikings. So their coaching staff, I mean, obviously it's Jefferson's talent, but their coaching staff deserves credit too. He had six for 85 and a touchdown on eight targets in this game. And like you said, they were doing things to take him away, but you can't, you know, you can't make it easy for the opponent to just take a guy like that uh, away. So Deontay, the the Vikings jumped out in this game, 28, nothing with about six minutes left. In the second quarter, the Packers come storming back. Packers had 465 yards of offense, but had four uh, turnovers. What else did you see in this game? What stood out to you? I mean, to me, a lot of this, this comes back to game script. Again, I think that really this was, and we talked about this in the Friday show, this was always going to be a rough opportunity for Jordan Love to have to walk back into, you know, a starting opportunity in the league and seeing Brian Flores. And then I think you saw early in the game, they landed in a lot of second and 11, second and 12s, third and 15s, third and 20s. And I mean, you're just not going to succeed against Brian Flores under those circumstances. And then when you have those poor bounces of the ball, a throw behind a receiver in the second quarter to your point, talking about when the game got away turns into a big interception and that just about felt like it sealed the game and that's not the only one of its kind um but ultimately and this comes back to what Steven was saying I mean my biggest takeaway echoes his sentiments you know for all the talk about two high defenses and you know wide receivers being a premium position and etc etc about the passing game it's so rare to come across guys that have legitimate gravity on the perimeter. Mm-hmm. And when I was watching Justin Jefferson, that's one of the few guys that's like got Steph Curry level gravity because Jordan Addison is able to step right into right in, right back into a starting uh, starting role and you get him targeted, you know, targeted opportunities in the red zone. You're able to find him deep downfield and all of that is only possible because of what Kevin O'Connell and Justin Jefferson are able to do within this offense. 
outside of that, I mean, the second half got really weird on the Packers in, you know, they were able to kind of pop some of the explosive plays that they couldn't get at all in the first half. But, you know, to Steven's point, I think that the final is probably misleading if we're talking about the flow of the game. By the time the Packers got it together, they were clearly Minnesota was clearly one good possession away at all times from putting the game away. I will say this about Jordan Love. I know he threw three picks. It was very Favre-esque. But that's how your quarterback should play when you're down 28 to nothing. You should be willing to put the ball in harm's way. You should be making those YOLO throws. Like the only reason they were able to get back in it was because Jordan Love was so reckless with his decision making when throwing downfield. Like it's honestly commendable. And like there are other things that could have swung this game. Their, Their kicker misses two field goals. Yeah. And they're not like super long field goals either. It's like 39 yards and 47 yards. They could have easily made those. That totally changes this game. So. I mean, I'm not too depressed if I'm I'm a Packers fan after this one. I know this the the start was bad, but I thought Jordan Love came into his own as the game went on. And I think the other positive thing to take away from this is that knee injury, even though it was clearly bothering Love, it didn't prevent him from being a downfield explosive passer like we've seen with other quarterbacks. Like in in Cincinnati, we've seen Joe Burrow really take a hit when he's taken a lower body injury. We've seen it affect the Chargers passing game with Justin Herbert nursing the high ankle sprain, but with Jordan love, like it still seems like deep passes are still on the menu in green Bay. I would have loved to see Malik Willis in this game go up and against Brian Flores, but I think it would have been ugly, yeah. especially if they fell behind early. Yeah. All right. This feels like a good spot for a, like what is real check here. Okay. Because the Minnesota Vikings are four and oh, they have beaten in three straight weeks, the San Francisco 49ers, the Houston Texans, and the Green Bay Packers, three teams that could all potentially be playoff teams. Kevin O'Connell, Brian Flores, incredible coaching job. The Packers are 2-2, two and two, but to your point, Jordan Love came back, maybe wasn't 100%, but threw for 389 yards and four touchdowns against Brian Flores. That's not nothing. I know, like you said, he had to just take chances, but it was only sacked once. That's an encouraging sign. They survived without him. They're still in the mix. So Ruiz, get look into the crystal ball. Like, do do you believe that the Vikings are close to this team? Like, is this a team that is going to win the NFC North? Uh, potentially, I guess, compete for the one seed in the NFC. We got to say that they're four and zero. Or do you believe more in the Packers as that type of team to win the division? Oh, yeah, it's hard to answer just because they have this big margin of error to work with. And I want to believe in this Vikings team. Like, I love Kevin O'Connell. I, I love Justin Jefferson. I like this this run game. I love Brian Flores. He's my favorite defensive coordinator in the NFL. But the quarterback is still the quarterback. And Sam Darnold showed once again, he still got that bozo in him. And he nearly <laughs> threw away the game in this one. And they had a 28-point lead. He nearly What did threw- he do in this one? He threw a pick and he fumbled in the fourth <laughs> quarter to let the Vikings get back. And he almost threw an interception, as I mentioned, on the first drive that would have taken points off the board again. Like, I, I think when he gets into one of these moments, he's going to show who he's been and who he who he will be going forward in his career. I, I'm not totally buying the turnaround. You're I'm leading Packers. Not. I can tell by the tone. Yeah. Okay. So you're I'm leading, leading Packers because I think yeah. they have the coaching staff to match Minnesota's coaching staff, not necessarily on the defensive side. I would take Brian Flores over half lead every day of the week. But Matt LaFleur is probably better than Kevin O'Connell at this point. I, it's, it's arguably close. The difference is one team has Jordan Love and the other one right. has Sam Darnold. So I'm going to go with Jordan Love, the more talented quarterback and the more trustworthy quarterback, which is odd to say about a guy who I just compared to Brett Favre, just who just three. threw three touchdowns. <laughs> all right, Deontay, uh, I I just keep waiting. I've been like, all right, this is going to be the week. Sam Darnold is, he goes 20 for 28. Yes, he, he, you know, he had a couple uh, turnovers, but he was making some nice throws in this game at 275 yards, three touchdowns. I haven't gotten fully on board. I've been Mr. Packer since the preseason, and so I'm not going to jump now, although I, I'm just very impressed with what the Vikings have done so far. Where are you with these two teams? I would say they're legitimately good, just not 4-0 and good. And, and to okay. Stephen's point, they've bought themselves a nice amount of margin for error when Sam Darnold does turn back into the Sam Darnold we've known him to be over the last half decade plus as a starting quarterback. But when you look at some of the things that would maybe not be so stable, right? And I think a lot of that for Minnesota is on the defensive side of the ball. 
Um, for, you know, as many turnovers as they forced, I think that they're only second to Green Bay in interception rate so far this year. I think they're top 10 in sack rate. So these are things that you would say like, hey, on a week by week basis, variants will probably tell you this will even out. You might not be as successful, even given the fact that they blitz a bunch. But you think about the fact that they're winning and still giving up explosive plays. Right. So if they found a way to be successful, despite giving up, you know, 20 plus yard uh, completions at about an 8 percent rate, which is top 10 allowed in the league or bottom 10 allowed in the league. And they've still looked good defensively. To me, that tells me that this is just more kind of locked into who they are identity wise and less about them just kind of riding the lightning on a week by week basis. Right. I think that if turnover luck kind of goes the opposite way on the offensive end, you'll see things maybe kind of even back out. But for the most part, what they're doing and how they've been successful feels sustainable to me. The run game feels sustainable to me. Getting the ball to Justin Jefferson on early downs has been sustainable for them for as long as he's been a Viking. And I don't plan on that. I don't imagine that changing. And I'm sure that they don't plan on it changing and having Jordan Addison back healthy, I think kind of evens out the roles with this wide receiver room, getting uh, Jalen Naylor more as a wide receiver three and not having to rely on him when Addison is, excuse me, when Jefferson is being double team. So while I don't think they're contenders because of who's starting at quarterback for them, I think it would also be foolish to ignore what they've accomplished over the last two to three weeks mm-hmm. and say that they're not a good team. I would say that they are good, just maybe not really four and oh good the way that we would conceive of an undefeated team at this stage in the year. Yeah. I think the one thing you have to buy is not only the infrastructure of the the offense and the coaching staff, it's how good this defense is. That's the one thing I'm not really gonna question because especially in a playoff environment where it's like heavily game planned, we are attacking the specific things you do. We're not trying to establish a program in a way of playing defense throughout a 17 week season. We are focusing on what you do. I trust Brian Flores to at least give the offense a chance even if Sam Darnold has a meltdown game in the playoffs. I think they'll have a chance in every game they play in the playoffs. I do think their demise will be authored by the quarterback, though. Oh, my gosh. I just picture the Vikings fans listen to us. 4-0. We got the most impressive resume in the NFC. Vikings fans know better than anybody how this ends. Sam Darnold, 4-0 in London, going to face off against his former team, the New York Jets, in week five. What a story from the early season. All right, we'll take a break. Come back. Get to one more big takeaway. All right, we're back on the Ringer NFL show. We got a coach on the hot seat, it sounds like, based on the post-game presser. We got maybe an offense that found its way. I'm not sure. Deontay, Texans come back, beat the Jacksonville Jaguars 24-20. What did you see in this game? What's your big takeaway? I would. Here's how I would frame it. I think that despite Jacksonville really being within reach and having the lead for a lot of this game, it never really felt like they were in control of it. And I think that ultimately comes down to the difference in a quarterback that's talented and is in the right system versus one that is being failed by everything around him and building bad habits as a result of that. And it was just painted so clearly to me in the second half with all the opportunities that Jacksonville had to put this game away and them allowing Houston to just hang around, hang around, take the lead, go back and forth, and then ultimately outlast them to end the game. Um, And I think that you can look at the data and it would support what I'm saying here. CJ Shroud was top 10 in EPA and in success rate as a passer today. Trevor Lawrence, 14th and 19th. And I would say this was probably one of the better games that he's had this year. Um, This is probably the most complete game that Jacksonville has played this year. But you look at some of the underlying statistics, especially how they perform, how these two quarterbacks performed under pressure. And you can kind of see one guy who's building the right habits and one that has built a lot of scar tissue over the years this was trevor lawrence's fifth worst performance by epa when he was pressured today 
and he didn't throw any interceptions. So that that's to say that there's not a lot of high variant stuff that's working against him. This is just him missing throws, taking sacks and can't take sack situations, being bad on third down again, um, you know, not connecting with open receivers deep downfield. And then you look at Stroud on the other end and it's like a masterclass in sack avoidance, a masterclass in getting the ball to guys when they need when it needs to be there, being accurate at all three levels of the field in and out of the pocket. And you just kind of, I'm just watching these diverging paths with two guys that I, I thought would be battling back and forth for this division. And I think you get to see exactly why, despite Houston's struggles this year, why they still look good and are in the AFC hunt in Jacksonville, looking like their their season is over and their head coach is probably going to have to update the LinkedIn by the end of the year. Maybe maybe not the LinkedIn, maybe just the uh... – who, who wants to go on a golf trip? I, w- I would think just from having covered Doug Peterson, I think <laughs> after this thing ends, I don't know that he's going to need to update the resume and want to get, want to do this again. I think he might be good, you know, working on the short game a little bit. Golf, hey, listen, that's a good life. I, it looks I like wouldn't his, mind that life. It looks like his mind's already on the 18th green right now. It may watching be. Them I was going to say, if you watch the second half, it looked like, yeah. it looked like a team coached by a guy that is thinking nothing more about the 16th hole that he well, blew last week. And he was also thinking about throwing his player under the bus after this one which i like i kind of agree with them on the how so what, what, what was the kind of context of it there well he says that the the play caller he was referencing press taylor who's been a maligned offensive coordinator for the last couple of years uh he said well we can't go out there and make the plays for the players so he threw the players under the bus i kind of agree with them on this one they're like deontay alluded to trevor lawrence missed a couple of big opportunities on downfield throws if those throws happen who knows what? Who knows how this game looks? They got down to the red zone. They were running the ball well. They just couldn't finish off drives. And I think a lot of the players had issues executing in those situations. I don't think the play call was necessarily the root of the problem. But that doesn't explain the first three weeks of the season when the play calls weren't so good. And these players not developing, especially Trevor Lawrence, reflects poorly on the coaching staff. So, yep. I mean, I guess it's a valid criticism, but it's also a criticism on himself. Yeah, that I mean, that's why Doug Peterson was brought there to a hey, coach the quarterback, have the quarterback develop. If nothing else happened, and just he was not even top five, but just keep improving year over year, I think that would have been considered some type of victory. Where then you could say, all right, do we need to replace Peterson still with someone who can get us over the top? And Trevor Lawrence, I mean, it, it's wild, you know. The, and I believe Deontay when he said this was one of, might have been one of his better performances of the season. And then I look at the box score. And it's 18 for 33 for 169 yards. I I mean, he on the season, he's completing 53% of his passes and averaging six yards per attempt. That's not quite Bryce Young territory, but like you don't have to scroll up. You don't have to scroll down to get to Bryce Young. You know, it's going to be even even if you've got a real small monitor there, even if you're on your phone, that name's going to be next to it. So this couldn't have gone uh, any worse, Deontay, the way this season has gone. I mean, Sheil, and and I'm guilty of this. I know Steven's probably been guilty of this too. We have a lot of colleagues that can be guilty of this. I don't want to couch this with Trevor Lawrence anymore. We watched one of his draft peers, Zach Wilson, get absolutely set on fire for stuff like, for performances like this today. I'm saying this is one of his better performances, and it's not really a compliment. You can't miss these double moves deep down the field when you have a middle of the field safety beat. You can't have these sailed passes outside the numbers at a certain point, man, like enough has to be enough. I like the guy. He's talented. I think everybody here was all part of the consensus that believed that he was going to be not only the number one overall pick, but a guy that could take a, a franchise like Jacksonville and help turn it around. And to this point, no matter where I, I would like to diagnose the blame, we're not seeing a guy who is making any progress within this offense. And we're now multiple years now of working with Doug Peterson. And in a lot of ways, I would say he's regressing. His response to pressure looks like a guy who doesn't believe that he has the answers anymore. We're not seeing him scramble as effectively as we did last year when he was healthy. I actually thought that was one of the better parts of his game last year was being able to take off in two years ago as well. And when the accuracy starts dipping the way that it is, it it almost feels like a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way where things have gone bad, 
So now he has to press, he presses and things don't get better. And now you're just kind of down this rabbit hole of the bad turning worse and the worst turning into, you know, unviable situations. So I do think that Doug Peterson and Press Taylor have a lot of criticism that's rightfully so thrown in their direction. But for all of us who have been Trevor Lawrence believers over the years, I do think it's time for us to maybe confront the fact that we're dealing with a very talented quarterback. And wherever the scar tissue came from, at the end of the day, it's on him to be able to dig his way through it. And we just have not seen it. And if anything, I would say it's getting worse right now. But the, the one thing I would like push back against is the misses we're starting to see over the last two weeks. We didn't see pre-injury last year, and we didn't really see the year before that. Like this is a new development. There was no way to calibrate for Trevor Lawrence for getting how to complete a pass downfield coming into this season. Yeah. And it I'm inclined to believe that there's been a lack of development there and it's, it's a coaching issue. Like we've seen him make these throws before he accuracy wasn't an issue at Clemson. So I don't know. I'm inclined to believe that if you bring in a new coach, a a good coaching staff, that this is easily fixable and that the Jaguars aren't going to, you know, be stuck with a bad contract for the next four or five years or however long his contract lasts. I don't know. I would be optimistic still as a Jaguars fan because I have the quarterback in place. It's so obvious to see that this coaching staff is just not up to this job. And it's been seven years since Doug Peterson has led a team to more than 10 wins in a season. It's been a long time since 2017. And I, I, like, it doesn't start with Trevor. I, I feel like Trevor is way at the bottom of the list of concerns with this team right now. I wouldn't say way at the bottom. I, I think it's a failure all around. I agree with yeah. you. I mean, you can look at personnel uh, as well. Usually, if a quarterback quarterback is at a certain level, the floor would a fifty three percent completions and six yards per attempt. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm sure I know there are examples. I'm sure we can think of examples, but kind of how low it's gotten this year. And think of the issues you guys are describing: issues under pressure, accuracy decision making like there's a lot there and uh, I we all see it we all know that there's talent somewhere in there but he has been in the NFL for four years I know we don't like quarterback wins but this is wild they have not won a game that Trevor Lawrence has started they've lost nine straight games that Trevor Lawrence has started last time they won a game that he started was November 26th 2023 so yes I think I mean Peterson was asked after the game about his his job security, and I don't I don't think he liked the question. But zero and four is zero and four. I mean, we all know where this is going, and Shad Khan might already have his next uh, next coach picked out. As Ruiz told us before, maybe it's just Bill Belichick might already have a have a little house or a little uh, condo picked out right next to the uh, right next to the facility where he can go and and get a head start. But yeah, they're they are having a nightmare season, and that continues. All right. We'll take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to plant some flags after four weeks of the 2024 season. back on the ringer nfl chart so here's the exercise very simple plant your flag on something based on what you saw today based on what you've seen over the first four weeks of the season it can be game specific team specific whatever we don't really have rules for this we kind of just thought about it right before uh, we recorded the show but it's going to be fun ruiz start us off what are you planting your flag on? i'm planting my flag on the chiefs not having a top 10 offense this season for the second Yeah, more Chiefs slander. I know they won. I know Travis Kelsey had his breakout game. He had 85 yards or whatever it was on on 89. 89. I don't want to short him any yards. God knows he needs every yard he, he can get this season. Uh, but we saw Rasheed Rice go out with an injury. Ironically, it was Patrick Mahomes who accidentally collided with his knee that caused the injury. But now I'm totally concerned because I know we had this breakout from from Kelsey. But if Rasheed Rice isn't playing, and apparently the fear is a torn ACL, according yeah, to Adam Schefter. Yeah, the Athletic had that. Oh, okay, Adam Schefter, too. Yep, yeah, fear is a torn ACL. It didn't look good. I mean, it was a weird, like you said, it's a weird play, interception, and as soon as it happened, it, even the announcers and his teammates, it seemed like, uh-oh, this might not be good. No, but he had effectively replaced Kelsey as that reliable target over the middle when Kelsey was, was you know, looked slowed down over the first couple of weeks, and then at the end of last year and into the playoffs – 
And now that they don't have that, I don't know where they go with this receiving core. Isaiah Pacheco is out seemingly indefinitely. Hollywood Brown has an injury that's going to be long term. Xavier Worthy made a, a big touchdown catch today, a 54 yarder. And he made a, a big third down catch later in the game. But it's just splash plays with him for right now. We don't see him as that route runner who's going to be physical over the middle. He's a very small receiver. If anything, it's going to be very hard. It's going to be harder for him now that Rasheed Rice is out of the, the picture. So I don't know where the passing game goes from here. And they're running their offense through this Carson Steele guy on early downs. <laughs> How is that going to last? I, I don't know. Like at a certain point, you need talent. And we've talked about Andy Reid. I, I'm still not seeing him call plays that unlock easy buttons for Mahomes in this offense. I'm not seeing a guy flashing wide open over the middle. Even the passes to Kelsey took some some touch. He had to layer it over the second level of the defense. The worthy touchdown was a go ball for all intents and purposes. He had to make a, a, a perfect throw 60 yards downfield. It's nothing easy right now. And the only receiver that got targets in this game outside of uh, worthy was Justin Watson. So, like, you can't run an offense with Justin Watson being your second viable receiver on the roster. We didn't see a target for Juju Smith-Schuster. Uh, Sky Moore didn't get a target. None of those wide receivers, those ancillary guys, have stepped up this year. And with Rice out, where does the passing game go from here? We were worrying about it last week. Now it's even worse. This is last year all over again. I mean, and they won the Super Bowl. They, they still won the Super Bowl last year. But I just remember at the end of that thinking they're not going to do this again. And, you know, part of it is bad luck. Like Rasheed Rice, I mean, he was playing really well. If if Kelsey's coming on and Worthy's developing, you could talk yourself into, hey, this is going to look a lot different by Thanksgiving. But if Rice is out, I mean, yeah, you look at the box score, it's Travis Kelsey, it's Xavier Worthy, it's Noah Gray, it's Justin Watson. These are the guys getting traffic, I mean, get, getting uh, targets. Again, it looks very similar to last year. And then their defense is lights out. The Chargers couldn't do a thing. They get 12 first downs in the entire game. I know the Chargers were banged up, but the Chiefs still have that to, to lean on with their defense. Deontay, I think it's more with this group and the rest of the season – it's more on the personnel. If you're going to ding read for it, to me, it's more the the players on the field. Like I don't, I don't know how many. It's not a great group to be able to scheme up uh, a lot of stuff with, in my opinion. What What do you think? Is there enough to work with here? Where hey, if you are a great offensive coach, you can make it work, or is it just like these are the guys you're left with? Figure it out. Like last year, it might not always look pretty. Can I just add one? Uh, yeah, piece of key information before Deontay answers. He Andy has Patrick Mahomes. Players. Yes. And he picks the players still. Yeah, but he also has Patrick yeah. Mahomes. Through yeah. all things, through Patrick Mahomes, all things are possible. I, don't yeah. give me the wide receiver personnel is bad. And Rasheed Rice <laughs> just got injured this week. This has been a yeah. problem going on three years now. I'm with you, dude. I, honestly, the the I love the fact that you said it's about having Patrick Mahomes because if this was basketball and you had LeBron James and you were running the Princeton offense, I would call you a bozo <laughs> for it. I don't care about the back cuts. <laughs> I don't care about your beautiful RPOs and your bubble screens. I don't care about the slide routes. I don't care about the check downs and all these yak opportunities because this is something that's existed for the last two years. They are once again, one of the better teams in terms of yards after catch. I obviously expect that to change with Rasheed Rice's injury because he, he has been their yak guy over the last two years. But now without him, what are you going to do to make this offense viable? Because the one thing that Rasheed Rice gave them was enough cover to protect Travis Kelsey from having to take on a heavy workload in the regular season. You can't do that now. There is nobody that's going to take Rasheed Rice's targets and, and at least make them as productive as it was for them. He was their ISO, maybe not an ISO receiver in the sense of lining up as an X, lining up as an isolated tight end the way that Travis Kelsey did and winning on these difficult routes crossing the middle of the field. But he was, you know, choice routes, you know, something on the move against linebackers, against safeties because he could work from the slot. They don't have a guy that's a natural fit for that even if Xavier Worthy does continue to be an explosive play threat, to Steven's point, so much of it is going to be gadgety. It's going to be double moves. It's going to be flea flickers. It's going to be, th you know, end arounds like we saw week one. It's going to take much more work than it's worth on a week-by-week -week basis to try to get a guy like that open. And, and on the run game, from a run game perspective, the success rate is fine. And again, this existed last season where all the people who were, you know, supportive of the Chiefs were pointing to success rate, pointing to things that are more sustainable on a down-and-down -down basis. And there's nothing wrong with them on a down-and-down -down basis. This is just 
not just is it boring, I think it's a misuse of the quarterback that they have, and it's unimaginative. And I just want to see a little bit more imagination in offense, and it feels weird having to ask that of Andy Reid, who is a guy that we know loves nothing more than getting on the whiteboard and drawing up the best ways to get guys open. I, I should say the Chiefs are four zero, so this is gonna this yeah, is gonna four zero fourth in success rate, like Deontay said. But listen, this is the uh, aisle we're shopping in. I don't know. Does that make sense? You know what I'm talking about. It's talking about the Chiefs. It's different than talking about other teams. Exactly. The bar is higher with them. But this is gonna look great in their pre Super Bowl. Nobody believing us <laughs> mon- montage. Oh, so we're you're welcome yeah, for we're that. Be on a social City. media reel, one hundred percent. And I don't. Hey. I, I don't want to take anything from Kareem Hunt. I said that they were running the offense through Carson Steele. It's, they're actually running it through Kareem Hunt. Like it's 2018 all over again, which isn't much better. I mean, that when, when Mahomes just, you know, winds up and that bomb to Worthy, it just, that, that almost, cause you're just like, this is what, this is what could be, you know, 54 yards. He just play action, gets back there, chucks it, lands right in uh, Worthy's hands. So yeah, a little bit more of that. They're four and oh, they're going to win a lot of games because they're well rounded special teams, defense. Mahomes. It's just, it is an interesting question. What style of offense do we see them? Have, have you looked at their season? schedule to, to the point of it not is matters? It easy? Look at their schedule. They see no. two good teams between now and Thanksgiving. They have the 49ers <laughs> in a couple of weeks and they have the Bills the week before Thanksgiving week. This team is go. going to be 10 and 2, 9 mm-hmm. and 1 by the time we get there. We'll take a break, come back to a couple of things that Deontay and I are planning our flags on. We are back on the Ringer NFL show. Deontay, what do you got? All right, I'm playing on my flag on the t- on my take that the Bears are primed for a big surge and that Caleb Williams is going to overtake the rookie of the year race when he faces off with the commanders on October 27th. Wow. What did Caleb Williams do today? I would say it, it's all about the second half. So he had okay. the best second half by all quarterbacks if you look at success rate and EPA per drop back. This is something I was texting with Steven about um, as the game was going on earlier today. Just saying, like, you could just feel the momentum in every decision he was making. It wasn't about explosive offense. It was about doing the boring stuff much better than he had in the first three weeks of the year. It was about not taking silly sacks, you know, not putting the ball in harm's way. And when you take that out of his game, and this was something that was really not – In the scouting report, this was not something that was a concern, what we had seen over the last two weeks with the crazy turnovers, at least in terms of interceptions, right? We're not seeing uh, strip sacks. We were seeing him put the ball in harm's way down the field, which is not a part of his game. And now that that's been eliminated, you get a viable passing offense. And when you have that in addition to what they've been defensively, which has quietly been like one of the best at, um, you know, performing in high leverage, high variance situations, Top five on third down, if you look at EPA and success rate, we've top 10 in uh, the red zone. And when you put those things together and you're able to keep teams from putting together explosive plays, from finishing drives with touchdowns, they're able to get pressure out of their defensive interior and some of their secondary pass rushers in ways that I was really concerned about coming into the year. They have a really good combination of the pieces that they need to be successful on a week by week basis. All they really needed was for their rookie quarterback to not actively be in the way of success. And now that he's starting to clean up some of his play, we're starting to see more of the team that I think we were excited to talk about coming into the season. So your, your confidence level in the Shane Waldron of it all, shall we say? I, I did not mention that man. Oh, one I time. noticed nope. you didn't nope. mention him. That's why I'm bringing him up. <laughs> I noticed you didn't mention Shane Waldron. You didn't mention the offensive line. Like, like I, I know Caleb Williams. Hey, third highest success rate of any quarterback uh, this week. So the box score is not going to wow you. 17 for 23 for 157. But the success rate that kind of speaks to exactly what you were saying. These weren't just you know checkdowns that aren't doing anything. They were moving the football, and he was making good decisions, even if they weren't the most exciting decisions. However, is what they did sustainable with that OC? And with that offensive line and everything else around Caleb Williams the rest of the way. I don't know if they'll run the ball as well week by week the way that they did in the second half. I think that might be a little specific to the Rams and some of their struggles in their front seven. But it was nice to see that they could do what's obvious. 
knowing that they want to play with wider edges, knowing that they want to play with lighter boxes and give you a lot of soft zones and try to bring safeties into the run fit as the snap is happening. You've got to attack that with downhill runs. And we finally got to see DeAndre Swift get out on the perimeter and find some yardage. We were able to see him get downhill at times and get some explosive plays. They were able to run in short yardage situations in a way that they hadn't earlier in the year as well. So I do think that maybe that won't be as good, but to the point that I'm making, any and all gains in that department makes it better for Caleb Williams. And you see the defense has played well, and now that Caleb Williams isn't in his own way, I, I don't think that this is a team that's going to be at the top of the NFC North by Thanksgiving. But I do think that they will clearly be in the wild card race and one of the better teams in the NFC. And like I said, when they see the commanders on October 27th, I think that we'll get we'll probably be seeing Caleb Williams at the best that we have up to this point in the year. I think the key number from this game isn't just that success rate, 57.7. It's that in conjuncture conjuncture with the pressure rate. He was under pressure 42 yeah. percent of the time today and mitigated that pressure so well. It didn't make mistakes, didn't put the ball in harm's way and found completions repeatedly. I think we've seen him get better and better each and every week. He's gotten better from quarter to quarter, from half to half. Like, I would be so ecstatic if I was a Bears fans right now because, like, this is what it looks like. This There's nothing fake about his performance today. Like, he's doing quarterback things in the pocket, not in easy situations, not in, like, wide-open pockets where they schemed it up so there's a wide-open guy running downfield. He's had some of those opportunities and missed them, especially on these out-and-ups. He missed a couple of more out-and-ups today. I don't know, maybe just stop calling those plays, Shane Waldron, never call an out-and-up again. But otherwise, like, he's looks, he looks the part of a franchise quarterback in the pocket. All right. Well, I'm glad that Caleb Williams is making some progress. I like Caleb Williams. I think the Bears are are going to be in the mix for a playoff berth, but he's not winning offense. The offensive rookie of the year is pretty much over with the way Jaden Daniels is playing. Not only is Jaden Daniels going to win that, but the Commanders are winning the NFC East. That's oh. what I'm planting my flag on. This team, just six days after winning Monday Night Football, goes to Arizona and stomps the Arizona Cardinals. 42 to 14. They are three and one. The Cowboys, we all watched them on Thursday night. That wasn't the most impressive performance I've ever seen. The Eagles, did anyone watch the Eagles today? Do you know that Vic Fangio's defense I is wish I had. worse <laughs> than the Matt Patricia defense last year based on EPA per drive? Did you know that? Because it was ugly. 12 for 13. Baker Mayfield starts the game today, and that's over. And then I'm looking at this guy, Jaden Daniels, 26 for 30. 233 yards. They had nine possessions. They scored on seven of them. Last three games, they've had 22 offensive possessions, and they found points on 20 of them. One punt and one interception in a three-game stretch. The guy is playing fantastic. He's making good decisions. He's accurate within, like, the short and intermediate game. He's not missing throws. He missed one throw. It was an interception, and it really stood out because he hasn't missed those all season long. Then he's making high-level throws in this game. He's using his legs when he needs to. I don't think he took massive hits today, which is obviously the concern, along with the Cliff Kingsbury post-Halloween slide. I know uh, that that's, that's on my radar, too, uh, but... I don't know. I believe my eyes, what I'm seeing. With, I know they're not going to be this good, this offense, but Jaden Daniels, uh, for a rookie to be doing this, completing 82% of his passes, averaging 8.5 yards per attempt. By the way, look at their box score. Everybody complaining about who your quarterback's throwing to? Yeah, they got Terry McLaurin. Then it's Olamide Zacchaeus, Noah Brown, Zach Ertz and Luke, Luke McCaffrey. That's who he's throwing the football to. All right. Thanks to everyone for watching on FanDuel TV. For more, check us out on Spotify or at Ringer NFL on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts.